Hi, good afternoon, everyone. I'm here representing the mainland. <laughs> De dare I say Europe? Or <laughs> um, you'll be sorely missed if any of this goes through. I had to say that. Um, I, uh, I'm very honored to be here, so thank you very much to, uh, to Judy and the organizers. Um, it's great that in, at this stage you have this selection of people together to discuss this topic. Um, I think I'm going to go back to the Netherlands and copy the, the whole program, because um, it's, it's, it's really a critical time, I think, at which we are, and to have these kinds of conversations is all we can do. Um, I, I wish I could say I'm from the Netherlands and, and we, we figured this out just like we did dikes and uh, you know, those kinds of things, but uh, we didn't. Uh, we are a pretty great um, institution. It's called the Netherlands Institute for Sound and Vision, and we're based in Hilversum, which um, is uh, conveniently located oops, in, um, well, apparently the video doesn't work. Oh, there we go. Um, in the center of the country, uh, the middle of the country, because um, our history is very much tied up with the history of the public broadcasters in the Netherlands. So much like BFI, we, we have our own history and, and we do um, large scale um, preservation of radio and television. And Hilversum was simply the, the, the location where the first radio tower was placed because it could reach most of the country. Um, so this is us, our building. Uh, you should come visit, it's a really nice place. Uh, and so we, we've become really good at this like what Steve talked about, large-scale digital processes. We do um, uh, things with um, um, uh, uh, automatic metadata detection, and um, we do a speaker recognition, speech recognition, starting to do some experiments with uh, image uh, recognition, all to um, have to spend less time on uh, what's been our core business, uh, and also to be able to shift our focus. Um, because this is our history. Um, but we're um, broadening our perspective. We, we're, we're wanting to become uh, what we call a, an institute for media culture, which of course is incredibly um, a high goal to, uh, to, uh, to pursue. And um, this means that we, we are now collecting, and we've been doing so for, for a number of years, uh, websites related to media. Uh, we're collecting web video. Uh, we're starting to look into social media. Uh, games, uh, I, I set up the game archive a few years ago, and so we started with games from the 80s and 90s. So these are some of the exper experiences that we've had. Um, as of yet, we don't have any VR in our collection. We do have some 360 degree video, but I'll be mostly talking from my experience from preserving computer games from the 80s and 90s, Dutch computer games. Very obscure. If anyone can mention one, <laughs> be my guest. <laughs> uh, but they're pretty awesome. Um, and just, it was interesting, I just added this slide because at the start of the day there was this, this real utopian sense of like, oh, there's all this possibility and all these things we can do. And then we, we start to talk about the preservation side of things and I see white, uh, <laughs> white slides and, and people looking depressed, <laughs> no offense. Um, and this, is, uh, this has been one of our immersive artworks from the, from the 20th cent uh, 19th century, uh, Panorama Mesta. Um, it's, it's located in Den Haag and it's still there. Uh, we've done it before, we can do it again, so just want to encourage you. Um, so yeah, as an institute we um, saw um, uh, this VR thing happening and um, we had this, idea, this notion that this is going to be big, but how, how are we going to start to explore even doing something with this? So initially we, we saw it uh, as a, a medium to, uh, to distribute our collection in a new way. So this was a collection of, uh, of video materials that, or film materials that we had from the Dutch coal mines that have been closed for decades. And uh, we cr recreated this experience of being in this closed um, uh, environment and where it's really hot and noisy and all these things. And in the meantime, you could see, which is not historically accurate, but on a video screen, we were trying to experiment with what does it mean to have 2D linear content in a three-dimensional space. Um, then another project we did was this uh, particular one, Big Art Ride, where we uh, were asking ourselves what can we do with uh, this, uh, the social aspect in a virtual world where we put two, obviously, uh, people riding a bike, because we're Dutch, um, in two different locations and they have to race each other in a, in a city of the future and uh, surrounded by uh, beautiful artworks from the Europeana um, network. Uh, so it was kind of a promotional project. And so one, one bicycle would be placed in, uh, for instance, Paris, and the other one in Amsterdam, and people would race against each other. 
um, all ways to, oh, and then this one, uh, Bear 71 interactive documentary, one of my all-time favorites, and we were uh, a partner in that together with Google and the National Film Board of Canada to create a VR experience of that same, uh, of that same uh, online documentary. Uh, and all that was to, to get a sense of like, what is this new medium? Who are working on this? What's coming? And so uh, then obviously also the question of preservation came along. So what do we do with these proje projects, but also other projects? And um, digital preservation, as was just discussed, it, it, it stems from this sort of traditional um, way of looking at it, which says, uh, we do not interfere with the materials and the structures of the items, and we do not modify their appearance. So there's this sense of authenticity, integrity, and um, it's really at odds, I guess, in some, to some degree, with what these experiences are. What happens if you introduce subjectivity into the very material of media? And so this made me think of, um, this is uh, the Cunevin model. Are there any Welsh people in the audience? I've always wondered how you pronounce Cunevin. Um, and I think it's really helpful to help us understand where we're at. Uh, the R&D stage was mentioned, and I, th I think a lot of us, uh, for us, definitely we come from a simple context in which the appropriate response is to sense, categorize and respond, and then we can see best practices and we can adopt those. Um, I think in some cases we, we started to move into this complicated place where we analyze rather than categorize, but still our archives are very much centered around the activity of categorizing. Like this belongs to the Royal Library, this belongs to us as an audiovisual institution, this is a piece for a museum. In the age of convergence in media, that's just not doable anymore, and it was mentioned before. Um, and basically the essence of this, this model is that if you get it wrong, you slip into the pit of disorder. <laughs> so it's important that we get this right. <laughs> And I guess what's, uh, what's, what I see as most true, also listening today to everyone speaking, is that we're in this complex context in which we probe all the pilots that we're doing, the R&D stage. And I think it's really important to, to acknowledge that, to embrace that also, so that we don't slip, try to slip back already into the categorizing and try to control things in a way that are just not on par with what the developments are currently. We, we're just not there yet. So let's enjoy this stage. That would be my... Uh, um, so some of the work that I've been doing on computer games, and you don't have to read this whole slide, I have a summary, because this is the summary already, but this is the summary of the summary. Uh, basically what I started off doing was look at various um, uh, approaches, they were mentioned before, hardware preservation, migration, emulation, reinterpretation, re re and documentation, and then try to judge those on a number of factors. How sustainable are they? How scalable? Uh, how do they work in terms of giving access? How expensive are they? Um, and I had a few other um, things. And so I, I wrote about this, if you want to read, I, I called the piece the Game Shaped Archive, you can find it if you Google it. Um, and I called it the Game Shaped Archive because I think there's a sense in which we as archives have to become more flexible and adapt to the media or maybe conform to the media that we're trying to archive. Uh, so I'm wondering what the VR Shaped Archive would look like. So to talk the brief th briefly talk through them, uh, hardware preservation, we don't do a whole lot of that in um, the Netherlands Institute for Sound and Vision. We do have a big collection of radio and television objects, beautiful objects, beautiful design, but we don't actually use them. So as such, there is no preservation happening. Uh, it's just preserved as an object, I guess. Uh, but for games, uh, we realize that there is a, a really large network of people that have the, both the, um, the hardware, the collections, and the knowledge to, um, uh, to work with hardware uh, pertaining to games. And so we org whenever we organize events around our games collection, we collaborate with this network and we try to bring these people together and create an awareness of the importance of their collections and how they can preserve them for long term. Um, so everything you see here in terms of hardware is uh, on loan, basically, from uh, amateur collectors. Uh, we cannot ha we don't have the knowledge i don't think we have the means to 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 acquire the knowledge to start these big collections of computer games maybe in the future but as of yet we're trying to build these relationships and just become an important partner to these people and also help them out um, so you don't have to do everything yourself which i'll come back to later then emulation i think is a really interesting thing and it 
Um, it might sound a little boring, but a lot of it has to do with metadata because we're basically preparing ourselves for um, for emulation down the road. It's not always the case that we can start emulating tomorrow, but we have to be able to trust that at some point we will develop those things. And then what do we understand about the digital objects that we hold? Do we have the right metadata to, um, uh, to describe these environments? And the term environments I'm using is from the premise uh, met uh, preservation metadata model. Um, and I think it's really interesting that um, the, the sense of the environment, we haven't really used a lot as, uh, as an institution. It's new to us because so far we've wor worked with migration in which for it's all about formats. But with emulation, it becomes much more important to understand the environment, the software and hardware environment in which the original object played. And I think because we're all describing the same environments, essentially, I mean, uh, there's a lot of varieties, but they're basically universal these days. It's, this is a really interesting project that I, I love and I'm, I'm really expecting a lot of the outcome. It's by Yale University um, and they use Wikidata to describe not only formats but also environments. And essentially what they could do in the future is use that standardized data that's in an open public repository um, to point to um, an emulation environment called emulation as a service recreate that environment and all you would have to do as an archive is provide the objects um, and to, uh, that you want to have emulated. Um, so I think it's, it, emulation is definitely very promising. It's just not a, a thing that's, that's going to happen uh, tomorrow. So we have, need to prepare ourselves for that. And then documentation, finally. I um, just want to mention this project that we did um, around our uh, games collection. We um, had people play Let's Play videos, which is a really big phenomenon on YouTube. Uh, for those who don't know, a lot of kids watch people playing games. It's hard to imagine, but it's true. And um, so we tried to recreate that experience with old games in our museum. So we had museum visitors record themselves while playing old games from the 80s that usually are super boring and they only spend half a minute and then they're like, it's too hard, it's too weird. And in this case, they would spend 15, 20 minutes easily on a single game. And in the meantime, they would give us valuable inf information about the context in which they were relating it to other games, sometimes playing together with a parent, even a grandparent, that would, they would exchange experiences. So it's this beautiful, beautiful historical document. And I think there's a lot of creative ways that we haven't even explored yet, how we can document, uh, I guess, art also, but I'm most more talking about media, popular media in general. Um, and we did the same thing with the creators of these games. Um, we would interview them whilst they were playing their own game, which is also an interesting, uh, as an, a very different pers perspective about production and original context and stuff like that. Um, then reinterpretation, like I said, we did Bear 71 in VR. Um, uh, and um, uh, realizing that Flash, uh, the original technology for Bear 71, was becoming harder and harder to. Uh, to make accessible, um, so the, um, the technology used is WebVR, which is also why Google was involved. They wanted to experiment with that and see what they could do. Um, I think it's pretty cool. I still prefer the original, I have to be honest. And then there's this project that we did, again, with our games collection, um, which is pretty hysterical, I guess. But it's, it's a way of engaging in a new way with an original game, which was a, a terrible racing game from the 90s. Um, and we built a physical installation, and we called this uh, Time Travelers. Um, and uh, basically people could sit in a car, um, typical car from the 90s, like you'd expect, and they would go on holiday, because basically the racing game is you going on holiday to France or something. So for Dutch people it's a very recognizable, nostalgic experience. So we tried to recreate that by having the car set up in such a way that... And it's, uh, we, we call it an escape room on wheels, because uh, as they were driving, they had to do assignments. So every now and then we would just cut the game and just the, 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 the gas pedal wouldn't work anymore. And in augmented reality, they would get assignments for what they had to do within the car to be able to move on. So for instance, the car would break down, smoke would come into the car, or they would have, uh, have to race away from the, the police or find an alternative route, stuff like that. So this really weird mixture of modern technology with an old game, physical experience, people kind of not knowing what they were experiencing, but it was 
definitely a very uh, nostalgic experience with your, what, what the original game also was. Um, so I think um, thinking through what we've done in games and also what we're looking to do with VR, so like I said, we haven't started yet, but we're, we've, ha we've got some plans <laughs> for a pilot project that we want to start later this year. Um, and one of the main things I think is what we need to do is forge these new alliances or maybe existing alliances that we need to strengthen. And I already mentioned a few of, a few of these. Like, who would think that Wikidata could play a role in, in digital preservation? But I, I think it could be really interesting to explore that. Um, I think for us, uh, so some of these are Dutch, the MPO Fonds is a, is a fund that funds these kinds of productions. How can we collaborate with them to also perhaps move creators to do uh, to comply to standards, although we don't want to restrict their uh, creativity, of course, but still there there are possibilities there to uh, to explore that. Uh, then DocLab is uh, from the ITFA Documentary Festival. They've been a partner for years and we've been d discussing with makers for a long time, how can we preserve their works? We've done a few, not many. So this year we want to look at some of their VR projects. Um, but we need those guys because we don't have the knowledge to cover this whole field and to know what's important and what's not. So we need these experts and likewise with the games, what we did, we, we um, created a uh, canon of Dutch computer games. Um, and we did that together with a group of experts in the field. And then we published it also to create a sense of um, uh, urgency around the preservation of these games. Um, and it, that works really well, but we couldn't do that alone. We needed these experts from the field that pre previously we didn't even know them. So it was really a case of like building that network. Um, we're working with Lima, which is art preservation. Uh, they have, of course, a very specific, uh, much like was presented today, they can look at a case-by-case -case basis. We're interested in seeing how we can scale that, but we can learn so much from them. Um, then there's organizations like IPC, the Inter International, In uh, International Internet Preservation Consortium. And I think, is there such a thing for VR? Should we start such a thing for VR? Because <laughs> um, it's really important to have that international voice also towards maybe you know, the, the big technology providers. Like, why aren't we at the table uh, in discussions around um, uh, open VR and uh, the work that's been done with by these guys. Why is there n no representation from anyone from the cultural uh, heritage or archive uh, industry? 